This segment is brought to you by Pony Express. Check out the Community Edition and turn your Nexus 7 into a lean, mean, pen-testing machine. For all those hard-to-reach places, there's Pony Express. Visit them on the web at PonyExpress.com. And by Anapsis, the leading provider of solutions to protect ERP systems from cyber attacks. Customers can secure their SCP and Oracle business-critical platforms from espionage, sabotage, and financial fraud risks. Visit them on the web at Anapsis.com. Looking for a career change? Tenable Network Security is hiring. Everything from programmers to researchers. Check out all of the available positions at securityweekly.com forward slash tenable jobs. If you're listening to this show, check out the following two positions, both technical and both are work from home Nessus vulnerability research engineer and C software engineer. A couple of quick announcements for you as well. Security Weekly listeners receive 10% off all products in our store with the discount code IHACKNAKED, which now include Hack Naked stickers. Visit shop.securityweekly.com and get yours today. Larry is teaching SANS Wireless 617 Ethical Hacking and Defense coming up in Austin, May 18th, which is very soon through the 23rd. Baltimore, Maryland, June 13th through the 20th, and Berlin, Germany, 22nd through the 27th of June, and lots more places, so check out the SANS website for more course offerings. Mr. Santar Cangelo, myself and John Strand are doing a website, webcast even titled Cracking the Code, How Security Nerds Become IT Leaders, Part 1, titled From Penetration Testing Results to Improvement. It will be held on June 10th from 2 p.m. Eastern Time to 3 p.m. Eastern Time. You can get all of the details at securityweekly.com forward slash cracking the code. Mike, did you want to comment on said webcast while we're kind of in that nice transition where you're here and we just talked about it? Yeah, I mean, I'd love to. What what we're going to do is we're, we're going to go take a look at the opportunities that we have and some of the experience that you and John have shared with me uh, about what happens after a pen test. You've got your results and you need to start to influence some changes in your organization. And we're going to look at the opportunity that leadership has. We give people uh, a glimpse at a framework. So it's competency based. It's not uh, stuff you're going to find on a bumper sticker necessarily. And, um, you know, and I guess if it's okay with you, what I'd offer is if somebody has a specific challenge or question, shoot it to us ahead of time. We'll, you know, absolutely. We'll, we'll tackle what people need. We're going to, we're talking about doing this as a series. And so this is going to kind of be the intro. We're going to set the stage and, and we'll start talking about it. And then we can dive into specific topics as, as people want. But if somebody is in that situation right now where they're sitting there going, yeah, I, I've got the results right here. I, I need these people to understand. I, I need them to do something about it. Great. Let's shoot us a note. Let us know what's up it's and been we'll, we'll tackle it. It's been such a continuing trend in security since I've started in this industry for people to come to me or myself to experience the situation where I've discovered problems, I've got issues, either I found them myself, I've had a penetration test, I've done a vulnerability scan, I've, done a, I've got a vulnerability management program, but nothing seems to be changing, right? It's kind of right. like what Jack was talking about with burnout. And I was talking with Mike and I'm like, I think your leadership stuff ties into this better than anything I've ever seen in the past about helping to solve this problem. So that's why I'm so excited about this, this three-part series. No, I, I am too. And, you know, I, I've been rolling some of this out and I, I had that chance at Hot Topics to start talking about some of these things. And uh, I, I tell you, the, the conversations that I'm engaging in are, are good. And, you know, I, I come from this industry, uh, as you pointed out, really people, they should go look at your talk to see how you've described uh, wrangling me and focusing me properly. Yes. Uh, I've taken right Mike's direction. thoughts and ideas, <laughs> right? And I've wrangled him and I've kind of stuffed him into this kind of vortex almost of this problem that we have in security. Which yeah, I, I, and, that's right. another reason why I'm so excited about it because it's it's a good marriage, it's a good fit. No, I look, I, I'm as excited as you, and uh, you know what I like about it too is some people know that that I've been focusing on the communication side of this for a while now, and and I naturally default to that. But we're going to look at it from a leadership side, so we're going to look at how do you influence? What what are the factors of change? Yeah. And what's the difference between change and transformation? How do you how do you work somebody through that process so that you know six months from now, a year from now, you, you're not looking at the same report with the same findings, wondering why nothing changed. Mm -hmm. So, no, I, I'm excited. This will be fun. Absolutely. Are we ready to talk about Venom? Mm. Uh. 
and right, no- that's that's collectively the 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 Twitter security world response to Venom. Yeah, pretty much. Except yeah. the press, as we were talking about in between segments, has dubbed this worse than Heartbleed. <laughs> is it just because it has a cooler logo? Because it does have a cooler is, logo, is, right? Heartbleed. I mean, if your heart bleeds, we can still fix it. But if you get bitten and you have Venom, if someone doesn't suck it out, you're done. Or you have an antidote. I got an anecdote for you. Oh, no, you said an, an, antidote. An, anti- yes, yes. <laughs> if, if, if we look at it from the simple view of what is the impact once it is exploited, yes, it's worse than Heartbleed. Yes, you're absolutely uh, right, Carlos. But how easily can Heartbleed be exploited? Uh, pretty easily. It's yep. network reachable. Remotely. How about Venom? Well, no, Venom, you actually have to go in. You have to be in that VM. has to be running the hypervisor that you think uh, it's vulnerable. And it has to have the floppy drive enabled in it. So whoever configured the machine had to actually go in and add that as a device. And you have to be root on that VM. So the articles made it sound like, Carlos, that that floppy drive device was enabled on, like, everything. Uh, it depends. Are you installing the software? You, uh, for example, if if it is VirtualBox, yeah, it's by default. Is it Amazon EC2 or any of, of those um, host providers? Could be, but I've seen examples where it's not. I've seen others where it actually is. It it all depends on who's your sysadmin. Yeah, Amazon. Box. Amazon says they're not vulnerable, and Linode and what was the other one? Rax? DigitalOcean have already patched for it, which probably indicates they had that floppy disk driver enabled, installed, and configured. Yeah, many, many times it is used for um, the unintended install. When you bring up the machine and you want to bring that instance you want with certain features and settings, you have that floppy drive. That happens with VMware. For example, with VMware, you cannot deploy templates if you don't have the floppy drive. Really? So uh, I, that's what I was wondering. Like, why does anyone need to emulate a floppy drive in this day and age? But there are practical uses for that. Yes, specifically for un- unattended installs and deployments, specifically from templates. Hmm. We have a VM template that is configured a certain way. You want to deploy it and you want to have it run and auto configure itself many times to use that floppy drive. When you look at the vulnerability, vulnerability is very old. It has been there for quite a long time. Um, it is one of those uh, pieces of open source software, again, that somebody start looking at and going like, huh, this is vulnerable. Oh, it is a kind of 90s vulnerability. Let me start taking and checking who else has used this code. Oh, it's being used by QM, KVM, SEN. Oh, cool, interesting. All of these products grab this piece of open source software now integrated into their stack. Um, so yeah, that's a big problem. And now uh, the way I see it is cool exploit, very nice, VM escape. Uh, many people think that VM escapes are like unicorns and fairies and they don't exist, but they actually do. We have seen a couple in the past. And it boils down to how are you going to design your stuff now? How are you going to Mitigate now that you know that it's a lot easier to get this uh, type of exploit. Are you going to work with your cloud provider to make sure that your VMs do not share space on physical servers with other uh, customers of theirs? Or when you're building your own infrastructure internally, are you going to make sure that your critical servers run on their own set of physical hosts? Uh, isolated from other VMs that are going to run in probably a lower grade security physical host and another side. I, I remember having this discussion a couple of years ago in the podcast when we were talking about VMware and proper VMware design. And I remember myself mentioning, well, there's this thing called VM Escape. There have been a couple of bugs that VMware has patched on, on VM Escape. So you should have several VMware clusters depending on impact on your infrastructure and have VMs inside of those, depending on what risk are you uh, going to assume. Um, I remember getting a bunch of nasty emails from VMware fanatics and um, virtualization fanatics that go like, no, virtualization is the best thing that ever happened to this industry. I said, yeah, it's very useful, but you have to know how it works and you 
need to know how to design around it. You need to know how are you going to work with this new technology. It's not that it's new and shiny and I'm going to put it everywhere. It's how does it fit and what are the risks? So I, I kind of have three thoughts on this. Uh, some of which was listening to you, Carlos, kind of triggered some of these thoughts. One, uh, patching is, I think, easier than something like Heartbleed because the people like Rackspace, Linode, uh, DigitalOcean, Amazon, they have teams of people that are dedicated to doing just this. And once they apply the patch thousands and thousands, even millions of servers are instantly protected and mm -hmm. immune to this type of threat. The other thing is, on the targeting side for attackers, it's hard. If I want to specifically target Kevin in this particular attack, I have to know where his servers are hosted. I have to know that I have to be on the same hypervisor as him, on the same QMU instance as him, to spin up a guest. Um, in, in that sense, in, in that attack, I can be root on a digital ocean machine, for example. I mean, not to pick on them, but uh, I mean, we use them. They're a great provider. Uh, I can be root on that and potentially get access to the, the lower layers. Now, I'm sure there's other mitigating circumstances, um, but if I'm going to target Kevin or maybe someone next to Kevin, I want to become root on one of your Linux boxes, which that's a mitigating factor right there. I got to be root to even execute this attack. Uh, in Windows, I don't necessarily have to be according to some of the reports, but I think those are three very interesting aspects of this whole vulnerability that are, it's completely different from Heartbleed, completely different from a lot of vulnerabilities that we talk about, in fact. I'll just let everyone stew on that for a while. That was it. You, you would have to spin up a bunch of PMs in different data centers that yeah. the providers giving you. You have to watch the traffic and kind of know, okay, I'm in the same physical host as the target I want. Let me take over this host. And not only that, but if you take over that host, probably you can find that they're reusing credentials. And you can move laterally once you're in that network. So, so in the case of a cloud provider, it's quite a big impact since you can actually get an instance with root on it. But when we move over, let's say, to your internal environment, that's when it gets a bit more difficult. But as you mentioned, patching is also as easy as the cloud provider because almost all of these technologies, you can actually configure them uh, with live migration. So you're impacting your environment. If you have a properly designed environment where you can actually live migrate hosts of your host, to another host to patch this one, migrate VMs back, then patch the other one and you can kind of start doing that shuffling, the impact on your environment should be minimum, should be very low. Mm -hmm. And let's put it this way, if you're really looking to attack me, Paul, there's probably much easier ways than trying to, to use Venom. They just wait till you go to the bathroom and then have access to your laptop. Oh. Now he's going to be holding it. Oh, but you did mention damn. something that I was not considering, uh, for example, DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean actually gives you root on the box. Right. And some of these other vendors actually do give you root. So the impact now goes up if you're one of these um, customers of these cloud providers that mentioned that they were vulnerable. Yeah, I mean, I've used DigitalOcean, Linode, Amazon EC2 and Rackspace, and when you create an instance on any four of those providers in Linux, you, they give you the root. They give you root access. And did you check if they were giving you also a floppy disk? Enabled? I don't know because I've never, I've never thought like when I spin up a virtual instance to be like, oh, do I have a floppy disk? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. In my case, I use uh, DigitalOcean. I have a script that set up Metasploit already for me and a bunch of firewall rules and does a couple of Git pulls for it several tools, uh, but I, I'll have to check. I'll have to spin up a, a droplet. Yeah, and see if it gives you a um, yeah, floppy disk. Yep. So let me ask this question. Um, why so much pushback on Venom? I mean, like, we're starting to see now that, I mean, we, we, we're snarky about it, right? If, if you want to have a vulnerability today, you got to have, uh, you can't just have a logo. you got to have a logo. you got to have a theme song. you got to have, marketing. like, a cool. Yes. Yeah, so... 
But, you know, um, H.D. Moore pointed out on a, a, a chat a couple of folks were having on Twitter that, you know, yeah, but we still call it, you know, Conficker. We, we still talk about the Melissa uh, um, and the, you know, I love you virus and stuff. And so, I mean, these things over time, I mean, we're going back now, what, oh, yeah, 20 yeah, years? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, don't forget, these. don't forget, Mike, Blaster and Slammer yeah. were also pornographic films. So... I mean that adds to their. Were they really? Because I didn't know that. No, I'm just. Joking. Me neither. I feel really <laughs> bad that I didn't no, know just, that. I have no idea. Yeah. If they're yeah, not, they should be. I don't know. It, 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 uh, okay, so difference there is, it is different when <laughs> something's find, found out He's in thinking. the wild and it gets named, and it's a virus or something like that. Another one is when you're a vendor, a security vendor, and you find a vulnerability, and you go like, okay. Before this goes public and it gets patched, let me make a whole marketing campaign around it. Yeah. So when it actually goes public, I already have a logo, I have an FAQ page, I have nice graphics. A hashtag. A hashtag. hashtag. You gotta have a hashtag. I reached out to a number yeah. of the the you know the, the reporters and stuff, and yeah, we're ready to go. That's the difference between Comficker. Uh, and all of those versus what we are seeing with Venom and some of the other ones out there. It is this, um, hey, look at me, I'm cool. Or, oh, the, the phrase I hate at cons, when I meet somebody for the first time and they go like, don't you know who I am? And go like, do you want me to slap you now or slap you later? It's all of this evil is, is, la is later stuff. Is later an option? Yeah, it's it's. Yeah, I'll, I'll slap him later. <laughs> that was that was in Slammer Two, the sequel, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> oh <my goodness. laughs> or Twenty Seven, right? I mean, because they, they can never get enough sequels. This is One so more question on on <laughs> Venom and these types of things. Uh, and I'm curious how many people have had their executives come to them and say, "Whoa, I just saw the headline on Heartbleed, on Venom, on whatever." Is that something we got to worry about? I mean, like, are, by naming these things and and get engaging in the marketing, are we are it we helping? advancing yeah. it? Because if we are, I mean, I'm I'm happy to go. Cool, let's market let's the hell out of name all. Name everything. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. You, you do bring a very good point. I did not thought about it. Actually, does it? It I, brings attention to it. What what do we name WordPress vulnerabilities? Is it like train wreck version two hundred and forty seven? <laughs> Hey, it's a little it's a little too soon for train wreck jokes. <laughs> Is it was there a train wreck no. recently? I don't know. Yeah, yeah and, and, and Amtrak. Sorry. Yeah. Where have you where have you been? I've been reading about Venom. <laughs> Dude, he only watches porn sites. That's, That's right. Haven't I'll, you noticed? I'll, and Slammer Part twenty seven. <laughs> Yeah. I've been I've been hearing a lot that the the named vulnerabilities, as much as we hate them, are helping in the kind of larger scale organizations or even smaller scale, because they open up budget. It is you know enlightening management and executive staff that you know what there are problems in the world and we can't turn an eye to them because CNN is yelling at us. Oh, and that turns right around to. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry. Yeah, I mean that's I mean it's, it, it was Eric Wolf that kicked that off today and and um and you know. Paul, Paul, you were really funny. You're like, I suck at naming stuff, dude. I'm out. That was my whole contribution to this like <laughs> 38 tweet long thread yeah, it was, that they it had was a, it was about naming quick... stuff. My only thing was, I have no comment. I suck at naming things. But I tell you, I mean, it, it, it's a when you step back. I mean, you know, Kevin is or not Kevin as you were just saying. I mean, when you when you look at it and you say, all right, well, so hold on, does it help me get budget? You mean, like, I, I as soon as I heard that internally i went oh man so it means we're gonna beat the drum again and now we're gonna it's the hype cycle we're gonna build up around it you know and, and a, a point i made that's really tough to elaborate on with twitter is you know awareness we always get awareness in this industry we seem to think that awareness equates to people now that oh they read about it so they understand they 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 get the consequences they're going to give us the budget we're going to have full support they're going to know what to do it'll never happen again because awareness just means they read the freaking name that's it they they saw it they recognized it that was it. It doesn't mean that they understand it, that they that they want to understand it or anything else. So, yeah, if we get some budget now, short run, that's awesome. And, and, and then I look at it and go, but if we don't know how to explain, right, go back to Paul's earlier question, <coughs> the, vulnerability, the vulnerability ratings even matter. 
How do we now explain if this is better or worse than Heartbleed? And and where I they come to me and they go, hey man, I heard there were three named Vuln's this year, great right, because they're trying to be cool and, and talk the lingo. I can give you a budget. You go figure out which one to fix. What do we do? I think that we stop people from going to pornographic sites. That's what I think. Because I think so, that's so web filtering. Let's get back I, to the products. <laughs> I think that's far more of a risk than Venom. So I want to read you some statistics. There was recently a malvert. Now I sound like I'm on CSI Cyber. There was a malvertising campaign. <laughs> is that, how is that even a word? It's not a word. It's malware and advertise. And they anyway, there was malware on a lot of porn sites, and it was in a flash object, automatically. Compromised. It looks like just Windows only malware. Well, I don't, to my knowledge, I haven't gotten this malware, so, and I use OS 10, so it probably only is. Not that I frequent these sites, but these pornographic websites for re research purposes only. Mm -hmm. So these uh, adult portals, as they're called, some of them are. DrTuber.com. You've never heard of these websites, have you guys, right? These are totally foreign to you. Uh, NewVid.com. HardSexTube.com. There's a whole list of these uh, particular uh, we websites. The one I, I like the best is WinPorn.com. Is that You're like going a, through your bookmark trying to is that but is that what is win porn? Is that like the Windows logo? Or is that like the blue screen of death with a big hole in the middle? I don't what is win porn? Anyway. These sites you thought really hard about this. I did, didn't I? No, I'm i I'm making it up as I go, man. Um, yeah. so, no, it sound, it sounds totally like yeah. that. <laughs> on the fly. On the fly. Uh, so these sites account really, for... Really, honey, I don't know what that was. I thought it was a Windows site. I thought it's it was gotta be malware, right? It's got so these sites account for a combined two hundred and fifty million monthly visits. So now we start to understand why people who want to do bad things to your computer are gonna trojan these sites. Pun no pun intended. Um, so they ha these sites had malware that was embedded in uh, Flash and did all kinds of nasty things to your computer. I just thought it was kind of interesting. And it is for no other reason that I think uh, these sites are really popular, that they're targeted with some kind of Flash-based malware. So, so we're kind of back to watering hole attacks? Yeah, pretty much. Pretty they're much. Incredibly effective. I mean... Yeah, but porn's very popular. Yeah. It, it, it all depends what you want to target. And now when you think target. about it, you, you have security professionals who are going to be visiting these websites using VMs, and now you can use Venom. To break out of the, break VM. out of the Very VMs. Very nice. Yeah, if, like if, it. If, see, if they're going full circle. Box. But you totally left the suck the venom out part. I did. Which is ah. what really would have, that would have been the icing. <laughs> Mike, in every story, has to at least say the phrase, <laughs> suck the venom. I just, I maybe I just watched too much TV as a kid, but it was always like the snake bite, and you had to take the knife and cut the top layer of the skin off and suck the venom out before you died. So what you're saying to our audience which is, is tomorrow, totally false. you should go into your yeah. executive boardroom and say, I have to with suck the venom out. Out of our network. And, and that's how you get budget. So that, that's, Bring, your, that's what I'm getting at. Yeah, this I, 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 look at all of this stuff. Bring in a big so Bowie knife. With you. <laughs> you, you, you go back to the uh, kind of the basics of, oh, are we burnable? Yes or no? You should be able to answer that in a couple of minutes. Like, go, yeah, I know my environment. I know where we have VMs. I know what they're running on. Yes, I have proper inventory. It comes back to that basic. Do you actually know your environment? Carlos, do you, yeah. uh, are you saving on your electricity bill or? It's, it's <laughs> really. <laughs> it's really dark here, yeah. <laughs> Is it, uh, in, in, in fact, the podcast started during daylight and is it, it just got dark and I haven't gone and turned on the light. Okay. Electricity <laughs> is really just, expensive. Don't you have it all automated out? Can't you just yeah. like snap your fingers? Yeah, like, clap I can from off? my cell phone. See? Let me go here on my cell phone. Do it from the smart things. Which is tracking you with Wait, that. Yep. You know, that'd be a great t-shirt. Real <laughs> men do it from the smart things. <laughs> you know, my wife already has me Trademark. tagged. So That's close. right. It's got you branded and tagged. Yeah. Actually, she did. In fact, I have the. Uh, it's the ceiling fan. I have the ceiling fan on, but not the light. 
Oh, fail. He had to get up to turn the lights on. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it turned on the ceiling fan, but I didn't have the light on the ceiling fan on. <clears throat> Got to get on that, Carlos. Kevin, you had yeah. some stories in there. What did you uh... turn it on? Oh, wow. You're jumping over all the fun ones? I feel like I'd bounce out the, uh, the, the, your stories of real world impacting things like Venom and, and porn websites to some more uh, just fun things I've run across from a, a weird technology perspective. Uh, I'll just act, click <laughs> links at random. So a, a fun article I ran across today is the top link, Long Range Iris Scanning. So this is a, this is a project out of Carnegie Mellon that they're able to, uh, the use case being that they're going to deploy them into cop cars that can read your iris off of the rear view mirror. So when you look back Holy up, wow. the camera will pick up your, your iris and be able to do a biometric identification of who you are. So now we can actually start doing this from a very long range. Which is, is, there a, is there a database of everyone's iris signature? The article really didn't go into that, but I, mm. I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, if you go through a border, uh, if, you, uh, if you go into, I was going to say Disney World for a second, I think they might actually look at your eyes. Or they're no, they're taking a fingerprint. They're fingerprint. They're yeah. fingerprint Disney's thing. definitely fingerprint. But if you travel internationally, there's a probably a good chance you're going to have your iris read at some point, and that does really? go into somewhere. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Yep, go to Brazil. So if you wear sunglasses, it can defeat this entirely. I'm sure they'll find a way to, to get around that at some point. I, I don't sure. know. Yeah, I just thought it was very interesting. And the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the journalist who interviewed uh, some of the project members brought up the privacy implications of this. You know, yeah. long range iris scanning is kind of a really creepy thing. All biometric kind of uh, scanning techniques are really really kind of invasive to someone's privacy. And I agree. I don't like the fact that it, Disney had to give my fingerprint. But he Why countered with a very interesting viewpoint of I carry a cell phone. It does everything, but in a much more invasive way. Why? Mm -hmm. Why would I even care about biometrics? We're already doing it way better with way other technologies. Mm -hmm. Like, huh? The guy who's, hmm, it's just interesting. Mm. Very interesting. Um, let's That's see. That's scary. Where do we want? Do we want to talk about home routers? No, they were using a. Botnet. No, I feel like we've talked about those a lot. Talked really. about those a lot, huh? It still just comes Too up much. more and more. Uh, <laughs> I mean, so Soho hard. gear not hey, being updated. Why don't we talk about WordPress? We haven't brought that up. <laughs> <laughs> they had some yeah. creepy vulnerability. Speaking of creepy, WordPress. They're leaking. Devices. It's somehow leaking credentials to sites. I didn't get the whole full article, and that link isn't working, but there was some creepy vulnerability that you should check out. What I really wanted to talk about was. Taking a security program from zero to hero. Sounds like a great article, right? I see a good logo there, too. It's got a logo. This article has a loho. A lo a loho? A loho? A, loho? a soho? It has a soho yeah, a loho. loho. So that is a malware botnet. Malvertising soho loho <laughs> is really what I'm trying to say. Um, and it's interesting. When he talks about what your security program should be, there's, no, there's not a lot of technical details. There's not a lot of uh, vendor products, right? It's all about awareness, vision, people, process, technology to support that, workflow, communication, and community. And, I mean, just from hearing those terms, I, I think it's, it's better than most of the articles out there that I've read in a long time that talks about security. Because security really is all of those things, like community, communication, workflow, uh, people, process, vision, and awareness. And I, I would use those far and above, you know, cyber, APT, malvertising, for example. I'm only looking at it now for the first time. Um, I, I don't really feel that I, I have anything to detract from it. I, the, the thing that I always look at is I'm going to focus in on the communication side. I'm going to sidestep the article for a second. One of the things I noticed about mm, over the last decade, and it's shifted, we used to say, if people don't understand you, you need to communicate effectively. So I was the dude who would raise his hand and go, hey, I'm short, I'm bald, help me understand. What does that mean? And, and it, if you ask people, you get different answers, and it really didn't mean anything. And so the, the trend I started picking up about a year ago was, if you're really a good communicator, you over-communicate. No, actually, let's be really clear. Both of those. No, 
um, you know, Paul, it, when we do the the web uh, the webcasts, I'll get into what an effective communicator is. I'll show people how to evaluate it quickly. It take them thirty seconds or less for themselves or anybody else. But <clears throat> when we when we look at stuff like this, I like it. And if you're gonna if you're gonna use something like this as a framework, that's great. You know, I, I'll tell you something I do like about this. Somebody finally used awareness the right way. Step one, awareness, and it just says, right, quote, the first step is the understanding that you need one. Now, the only caveat I would say is awareness isn't actually understanding, right? Awareness is a realization. Mm -hmm. I'm parsing the words. I'm just doing it slightly intentionally. But if that is the first step. The first step says, especially if you're not this global enterprise, right? You're, you're, you're watching this show because you're saying, hey, you know what? I, I'm in IT in my company. We're an SMB. We probably need to do something. Yep, that's awareness. It's a realization. Hey, this stuff probably matters to us. We should. Yes. So that, that's actually the right way. It wasn't you need an awareness program that teaches everybody in the entire company how to you know how to program in Python so they can enumerate all their own ports. No, no, no. It's, it's different. Yes, um, and communication is different. And we talked about this. <clears throat> communication is important, right? Oh yeah. But it's different from actually getting people. So getting people to listen would be part of communication. Getting them to change their behavior is issue. influence. Not communication, and it's like, yep. to, I mean, you need good mm. communication to get to influence people to get them to change their behavior. Right. But those are like three totally different things. That's exactly correct. Yeah, you know, and, and the other thing to this too is is the communication wanders a little bit into relationships. Like it's it's it, my, the reason I'm I'm picking on it because I, I don't dislike the article, but the communication part it wanders right, and you should communicate. And that lets you have better relationships. And da, 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 da. whoa, hold on. There's like 50 words there it, that doesn't do all those things. So yeah, no, it's 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 important. It's it's um it's good. It's you know from zero to hero. Hero? I don't. Yeah, Let me ask you guys hero. this question though. These steps. I know every organization is different. It, what is this? Is this a, a one month effort? A, a one year effort? Multi year effort? I think it's an. I, I like. I like the step eight of community. Because I think that's the ultimate end goal, Mike, that you're never done. You're never done with security. That at the end, you've built a community that continues to do yeah. all of those other things like communicate and teamwork and process and all those things. But you've built a community around security. And look, I mean, a few people will argue with me when they say getting security done in a university setting is one of the most challenging roles that, that I agree. you can take I agree. on. And the way that I, when I left, the way I was approaching that problem was I had tried a lot of things and they hadn't worked and I built community. And that was the way I have regular meetings. You know, a lot of what Frank talks about having the regular community meetings in all the mm -hmm. various geographic locations. I started doing that at my own conference. I started doing training classes to everyone who wanted to attend. I just essentially tried to build community a around the security culture and that was, I think, far and above one yep. of the things that really helped because once one person joins the community and kind of gets on board, they start telling other people about, well, you know, I you know, attended these meetings and we did these different things and learned about these different things. And then yep. we had this vulnerability assessment and we made some things better and we helped us talk to management. They go, oh, People are like, I want to be part of that too. I want to be part of the community. And before well, you plus, know it, your community is growing and you're doing security. Well, and, and then they start to know you. They, and, yes. and they're like, oh, wait, you like cigars? I like cigars. We should talk. Oh, you know, you, you, you drive this type of car. You like this type of camera. You, you like drones, right? You, you, you automate your house. Wait, I want to do it. And so, you know, the thing I've always talked about from that community side to it is it, we need to bring our external interests into work because that's how we're going to – that's how we become compatible with other people when they start seeing us as actual people. You know, what I loved about what you just described too and because, I, you know, when I if – you, if you only skim this article and you see community, you think, oh, like, like podcasts and going to conferences and stuff. And it's, it's exactly what you described, Paul. Build the community in your organization. Right. You know, again, right, I, I'm going to come back to you. We keep – I'm adamant and, and I'm, I'm, I, I looked, I've looked at the numbers, but – but fundamentally, when we say that we have a shortage of people in information security, um, that, that's a that's a temporal problem. That's just based on today, based on the way that we've been doing things and in, in the shifts that we need to make. You want to start solving that problem. You're in that position right now where you got to do more with less and you're, you're pulling your hair out and you're facing burnout. Then, then community is your answer because in every organization I've ever been in, there's people who will come to me and say, Michael, why is the security team trying to do A, B, and C? We, we can do that ourselves. 
yep, you know what, guys? Build the community, trust them, let them do it better, and, and teach them what they need to know about security. They'll teach you about whatever they know better than you. You guys can work together. You can take that off your desk, and you can go on to the next problem. And I think, like a lot of security people may be intimidated by that, but think of it this way. If you can integrate all those other areas of the organization into security or get security integrated into their processes, let them do their own vulnerability assessments or however you're going to enable them, that doesn't remove you as a security person from that role. Exactly right. Your role then becomes staying ahead. Now you have time to stay ahead. You're not playing catch-up anymore because everyone's doing what they should be in terms of security. That allows you to stay ahead of what's the next threat. How do we stay ahead of this next threat looking into the future and saying this this is going to be a problem? How often you know, cloud computing's coming. We should probably worry about VM escape. And start building that into the culture so by the time it's a problem, yes. your teams have already yes. integrated that into their processes. Think about this, right? You go in and you say, hey, guys, I'm here. I'm going to run a vulnerability scan or, or whatever. And they're like, oh, I got work to do. The minute you teach them how and you give them the power to do it, I, mm -hmm. I, I have never seen a situation where they do it less frequently than you did. Once they understand it, they understand it and you give them the power to press the button. They're doing it all yep. the damn time. Why? I got to see. I want to see. I want to know. I, you've created something. Now, that's an interesting point, too, because what we usually find is that once somebody becomes aware, right, like the realization Oh, we got to do something. And then we gave them a tool. Okay, I'm going to go do it all the time, all the time, all the time. We kind of have to walk them back and say, okay, cool, awesome. I love your enthusiasm. This is great. You're, I'm with you. We don't need to do it every day. Mm -hmm. You just took I was, I was good with quarterly. You're trying to do it every day. Why don't we, why don't we try weekly for a while? Yeah. Let's see where that goes, right? <sighs> you know, and it, but like the fact that they've got it now, when we give them some of that control, yeah, Paul – we don't lose that. We don't lose our value mm -hmm. as a security person. We actually gain it, right? So anyway, yeah, that's I, this is this is a decidedly a good article. If for no other reason than it, it's going to generate some good conversation in your that's organization. That's exactly why mm -hmm. I put it in there because it, it's a good conversation starter. You are a good wrangler of ideas. I wrangle, <laughs> you know. I do. I wrangle, and I might even wear wrangler jeans. I mean, on the next show. I mean, who knows? I got the jean shirt. Maybe next week it's the jean pants. Get you a lasso and a pair of chaps. That's be right. all set. And for those listening, yes, I am wearing pants in this episode. <laughs> just so you know. Yes. Chris is, is motioning me and may, he wants to make eye contact with me very lovingly, saying that we should talk about the next story. Venom? Venom? 2.0. What? Malvertising? Um... <laughs> Uh, Mr. Not Kevin, oh, what do you want? You want to talk about amateur cryptography? Is that like amateur photography, but not really? No, it's, uh, I'll sum up that story really quickly. Um, there's an open source protocol for smart devices, uh, power meters, things like that. Uh, but the, it's a technical paper that's essentially saying you really shouldn't roll your own crypto. It's a really bad idea. Really bad. Um, Almost as bad as the USA Freedom Act, which was – what is that all about? Uh, so so the, Section 215 of the, the, the Patriot Act is sunsetting June 1st, and uh, a bill hit the, the floor a couple days ago to uh, at least put to vote the, the USA Freedom Act, which is a step towards uh, limiting and curtailing the powers of bulk surveillance. So uh, – which is so a great this thing. a good thing? This could be a good thing. This is like an amendment to the Patriot Act to make it so people yeah. can't spy on us as much? Essentially. Un unfortunately, the flip side to that is that it also um, solidifies many of the things that the, the yeah. bulk surveillance does. So instead of the, the uh, NSA going out there and doing metadata collection, mm -hmm. now the telcos do it. But we can, they can still subpoena them for the same records. But now it's a legal process versus a gray area with the FISA court. So there are, you know, kind of, uh, but the downside is, is that when the bill was uh, voted on, it was voted on with no amendments. So it's going. And mm -hmm. if they're going to turn it down or not. I got you. So they still have to vote on they it? They still have to vote on it, but yep. it passed. I got you. So it, at least it's a first step, uh, uh, which is a great thing. Uh, it, it is an improvement. And for the first time since 9-11, for the, uh, something related to Patriot Act and terrorism is being curtailed. It's not being expanded. Yep. That's good. Because af after all, all of this metadata, as uh, our good friends at the NSA have said in all of their uh, meetings with the Senate and, and the House, um, it has helped to stop 
one tech, and it was a guy who sent a couple of thousand dollars to some Somali terrorists. So it actually worked. All of those billions of dollars and data, big data centers and big machines actually worked once that they can reference publicly. Interesting. Well, <clears throat> that about rounds out the stories for this week. Um, I think now we're going to close out the show. I want to thank everyone for watching and listening to Security Weekly. Um, make sure you come see us at Source of Boston if you're going to be around. And uh, thanks to our illustrious hosts, Mr. Not Kevin here in studio, Carlos and uh, Mr. Santar Cangelo. We've, we've been enjoying this, the Cangelo shots throughout the show. We're going to put these back in the fridge, maybe break them up for next week. We heart Apollo. Yes, we love Apollo. We saw him at uh, B-Sides Boston, which was a great conference mm. uh, as well. So, again, thanks, everyone, for tuning in. We'll see you on the next episode of Security Weekly. Over and out. <laughs>